Here we are, gentlemen, episode 200. To mark this milestone, I figured it'd be fun to look back on how far we've come, while at the same time recognizing the core principles that have remained consistent since the dawn of X and Y communications history. What better way to do that than present for you, in all of its year 2020 remastered glory, my 2007 interview with David D'Angelo, a.k.a. Eben Pagan. Now, back in the day... Landing this gig was for a dating coach, a lot like getting on The Tonight Show was for stand-up comedians. I had the thrill of getting the February 2007 slot, having only opened the doors to XMI Communications a short time before. To this day, I'm grateful to Eben for that tremendous vote of confidence. And yes, even though this has been premium content behind Double Your Dating's paywall for over a decade, I indeed got the green light to give it away to you in celebration of 200 episodes. So many thanks to Double Your Dating and the folks over there for making that possible. I also want to express sincere appreciation to all the sponsors of The Mountaintop, each of whom does real honest work in helping us be better men. First of all, we salute our friends at Let's Get Checked. What I love about them is they save you a trip to the doctor. They're simple and fast. Listen, every one of us as men, all of us, should get our testosterone level checked and Let's Get Checked is the way it's done in 2020. No waiting in a doctor's office, no risk of catching what the guy next to you is in for, no embarrassing face-to-face -face eval, only a discreet self-administered test that couldn't be easier. All the shipping is included and prepaid with their one low testing fee. So there's no searching for a box, running out of tape, or anything else you might be picturing. It's laughably easy. You get your test results verified by a real doctor and a real nurse contacts you via phone. Check it out for yourself at mountaintoppodcast.com front slash LGC for Let's Get Checked. Hey, if I can do it, you can do it. Let's Get Checked. Also, a shout out to Lucas and the guys over at Heroes Soap Company. Listen, gentlemen, you've just got to go to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash hero soap and see what the hero bundle is all about, or at the very least, grab all you can of their peppermint plus cool or rosemary eucalyptus, which I call new car smell for dudes. It's legit. So also are David and Josh over at Keyport, the purveyors of the baddest-ass 21st century daily carry devices you've ever imagined. This is not your grandfather's pocket knife, for sure. And be on the lookout for a very cool giveaway contest from those guys in the very near future. And of course, big thanks to Jocko, Pete, and Brian at Origin. Listen, despite less than optimal lockdown conditions in the state of Maine, these guys are powering through it. Kind of like how Jocko's Mulk Protein powers you up without filling you full of fake chemicals. Also, even though they've been cranking out face masks to meet the demand these days, several of you guys out there have reported getting your orders in the mail for their insanely well-made and ridiculously comfortable hoodies. Get you some of all of that while the getting's good over at mountaintoppodcast.com front slash origin for sure. And now, enjoy the newly remastered version of my classic Dating Gurus interview with the one and only David D'Angelo. It's probably going to be weird to hear someone else interview me for a change, but hey, why not? By the way, you'll hear references to several programs in there that you may have never heard me talk about before. All of them are still available, and I'll post links to them on the show notes page. You can also get David D's legendary book, Double Your Dating, by going to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash David D. So, enough already. Thank you guys so much for all the support over all these years, 200 big episodes. Here we go. Live from the mist and shrouded mountaintop fortress that is X and Y Communications Headquarters, you're listening to the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. And now, here's your host, Scott McKay. Hey, this is David D'Angelo. Welcome to another edition of my Interviews with Dating Gurus program. Today I'm talking to a gentleman named Scott McKay, and uh, he has some very interesting things to say about how to become more successful with women in dating. Um, he tends to specialize in a few areas that uh, I really haven't heard of before, so I'm really looking forward to this interview. Um, one of the areas is 
not just how to meet a lot of women, which he's going to explain some techniques for that as well, but how to go from being good with women to being amazing with women. Uh, he's also going to talk about how to find and attract a quality woman, not just any woman, but that special woman that is the right woman for you. So I'd like to welcome you, Scott. Thank you, Dave. It's good to be here. So um, tell me a little bit more about yourself here, and because uh, you and I are just getting to know each other, and uh, your background, You know how you learned some of this stuff. Well, I'll tell you, a little over four years ago, I was faced with an unexpected divorce that was very difficult. Everybody I knew told me that there was nothing I could have done to have been a better husband and that it was all my ex-wife's fault. And there's really, you know, Scott, there's just nothing you could have done. You're such a nice guy. And I was very uncomfortable with a victim's mindset. In other words, I didn't like the feeling I had thinking, hey, something bad's been done to me and it was out of my control. So what I did was I started on a journey saying to myself, whatever it takes, I'm going to become the best man I can possibly be for the next woman I spend a considerable amount of time with. Hmm. And this involved me not only spending some time with some women through online dating, which we'll talk about, mm -hmm. but also learning from some guys whose material I really related to. And David, yours was one of the most influential books that I read, Double Your Dating, changed my life, got me on the road to really improving my skills with women. And I started realizing the importance of not only going out, meeting women, practicing my skills with them, but also understanding more how women operate. Like you would say, getting inside the mind of a woman. And that was all immensely helpful to me. Eventually, my dating life was going so well that my friends started asking me about it. They said, hey, you know, McKay, you know, you're not the best looking guy in the world. How are you getting all these amazing women? And I started telling them about the things I've been learning and the journey that I've been going on. And it occurred to me that no other guys, I mean, practically under 1% of all guys out there ever take the time to actually go learn about women and how they can be better with them. Mm. So I became sought after by my friends that turned into me getting emails from people I didn't even know saying, Hey, someone told me I should talk to you. <laughs> yeah. Finally, that turned into a newsletter. And here we are four years later with X and Y communications, which is basically a one-stop shop for dating resources. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's my full-time job helping guys now. Mm. That's fantastic. So, uh, tell me a little bit, uh, you know, I kind of like to start with mindset and inner game type stuff. If, you know, if that makes sense, sure. um, what are some of the big realizations that you had that were the, you know, shifts that you went through? What are some of the mindset things that you use when kind of thinking about how to attract a quality woman and, you know, maybe what are some of the inner game things that you've incorporated into the, um, you know, the program? I mean, I'm really interested to see how this all fits together. Basically, if you read anything I've ever written, it all comes down in my mind for a guy to deserve what he wants. You know, we go to college for a four-year degree, master's degrees, doctorates for our careers and for, you know, learning knowledge about what we need to know in life. We go to driving school to learn how to drive. We even go to the golf range and learn how to practice our swing. But when it comes to attracting women and becoming the guy we need to attract the woman we most want, we all sit around on the couch watching football waiting for this woman to just show up someday, right? Mm. So I'm thinking, and it turned out to be a revolutionary thought to some degree. I haven't seen, about, seen it written about much elsewhere. Let's talk about what it's going to take. What's the heavy lifting involved to learn how to deserve the kind of woman I want. And what I mean by that is I know friends of mine who don't take care of themselves. They don't know the first thing about what women are really looking for. And they say, hey, you know what? I'm going to get my own private Jessica Simpson or JLo someday. And, you know, she's going to come along and she's just going to accept me for who I am. My way of thinking is I want to make sure I do my part in becoming the kind of guy who is going to deserve that woman. Instead of me being a lucky guy, I want her to be a lucky woman. And actually, luck has nothing to do with it. It's all about good fortune. So that has been the guiding principle of just about everything I do. That and the concept of, man, if I'm going to spend a long time with a woman, I have to have, there's really no other choice. I have to have a mindset that says, I'm not going to settle for anyone less than who I want. A lot of times people say, hey, you know what? You're being too picky. 
Well, if you're being too picky and it's not working, you just need to go deserve what you want some more. Because if we are with a woman we are not happy with long term, we're going to start living vicariously, drowning in pornography, thinking about other women. The feeling I have, I think that would be the most, the, the greatest insult to a guy that he's only going to wake up and find out later after he settled for the wrong woman is everywhere he goes, he knows other guys have sharper women than he does. And there's nothing he can do about it because he's married to her. Mm. And that may sound like a harsh thing to say, but when guys are living that, that's when infidelity, bad relationships, and everything else that manifests itself, when people just aren't enjoying the company of their significant other, that's when all that stuff happens. And what better time to avoid that, David, than before you're committed to her, mm. before you've selected the wrong woman? That's the time to figure all this out. Well, you're talking about two sides of uh, kind of like two edges of a, a knife or two sides of a coin. Um, and instead of it being the positive and negative, they're kind of both the the keys, I think, which are, number one, the kind of the deep inner feeling of deserving. That concept of deserving is something that uh, a mentor of mine really drilled into my head is that if you don't feel that you deserve something, you're going to push it away from you. You know, you're not going to get it. And I think what you're saying that's fascinating to me is the concept of learning to deserve. That idea that you can learn to deserve is a very powerful one. And uh, I, I really I really like that. It's something that I've always framed differently. It's kind of more like you have to program yourself to deserve or you have to um, affirm yourself to the deserve or change your self-image so you deserve. But you're, I don't know, kind of putting it in a more simple, uh, straightforward way, which is learn to deserve and then the other side is the idea of having a system that you use and a set of standards so that you find a quality woman. So it's kind of the inner and the outer. And it's a, I think it's a great, powerful combination. I think you're exactly right. Not only do we have to change our mindset of saying, hey, you know, I'm just going to wait around and do nothing. And someday I'll meet a woman who accepts me for who I am. We have to change who that person is. A lot of times, especially in this culture, people embark on self-help ventures and end up failing a large percentage of the time. My personal theory on that is because there's such a high priority on being oneself in this culture that after you reach a certain age, it's really hard to go through the pain of essentially not being yourself while you're learning new habits. You have to kind of go through the process of risking looking fake, as it were, quote unquote, with the end game in mind, with the prize, as it were, of becoming a better man at the end of the road. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yes. So deserving what one wants, hey, look, I'm only getting this certain kind of woman, you might be saying to yourself. I know I should be attracting and earning the affection of better women than this. I just know I deserve better. First of all, clear out the obstacles of the past. If there's a divorce that's haunting you, if someone has said something insulting to you in the past that still haunts you, whatever the situation that's creating an obstacle for you in the past, that has to be conquered. Then, this is ironic, but the next step is a guy has to know what he's looking for. And this was a very, very important process for me. The next is you have to know how to go get that person and then build a life around that. So, the, yeah, there's a lot of process to this, not just thinking and saying, hey, you know what I'm going to do? I'm from now on going to think I'm going to deserve someone. You're absolutely right, David. A guy has to go out and do something about it. And that's that's the central premise pretty much of what I do. And, uh, you know, it sounds like you've, um, I don't know, you've crossed this bridge or you've made this distinction in your life, which is that. Quantity and quality in terms of women are very different. And having a large quantity of women is not necessarily a bad thing, but at some point you might want to start focusing on quality and that there's, I don't know, a way to do that and that it can lead to greater joy, fulfillment, happiness. Certainly. You know, if I'm a guy who's struggling even meeting women, I need to start at the ground level with meeting women, attracting women 101. Learn how to get phone numbers, learn how to approach women, get over approach anxiety. And I need to learn how to have those women like me in return. Once I'm getting a bunch of first dates, it's easy for me to feel like, hey, I've got this conquered. 
I've got this part of my life handled. But the truth of the matter is, if I go out with 400 women this year, I may be a hero to some. But in my mind, at this point, the truth is, that means I didn't get a whole lot of second dates. Mm -hmm. (laughs) If you think about it, that's basically what it boils down to. Mm -hmm. I think taking it to the next level, learning how to have total control over one's dating life such that, hey, I know exactly how many women I want to be dating at one time. And I want to have the power to be able to add women to the number I'm dating right now or elegantly remove them from the picture by breaking up or saying, hey, let's just be friends. Imagine a man giving a woman to just be friends talk. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of level we're talking here. And say to yourself, okay, look, I've challenged myself. Maybe I had a certain type of woman I've always thought I was attracted to. My own personal experience is that I, I really like petite brunette women. So I'm going to date a bunch of petite brunette women. That's one level. However, and you said this a lot of times also, David, the really best way to figure out what you want in a woman is to date a lot of women. Instead of, you know, looking at the posters of these supermodels on your wall saying, okay, I'd like one like that and maybe this one. Oh, if I could just put this face on that body. No, the best way to figure out what a guy really wants in a woman is to go out and date a bunch of women. So, hey, this woman is a little taller Maybe she's built a little differently. Her attitude is different. You know, she's got really short hair. I've never been out with a woman like that before. Putting some variety, there's that word variety, some variety in your life as far as the types of women you're dating can really make some, have you, have you reached some aha moments, as you like to say, David, Mm -hmm. as far as saying, Hey, you know, I only thought I liked a woman with a little bit of, you know, kind of an edge to her personality. The truth is when the chips are down, I really like sweethearts. Mm. I only thought I liked women who were very challenging and strong-willed. Or you may think the opposite. Every man's experience is going to be different. But by dating a bunch of women, you find out better the kind of woman you're looking for. Now, I enjoy dating multiple women at once for a long time. I realized very quickly, which has been covered enough by other dating gurus you've interviewed and by yourself, David, that once you get two women, you tend to get 50. Women buy on the approval of others. It's just like a sales principle. And once you start attracting women and you build that confidence that says, hey, look at this. Look at me. I can attract women. You have that natural flow about you that women are attracted to because they can sense the confidence. They can sense that other women are buying what you're selling and they want some of it. From there, things get rolling quickly. In my case, I built a spreadsheet. (laughs) I've heard other guys have done this before also. But I started saying, okay, what do I like about these women I'm spending time with? And I was able to say to myself, okay, I know I don't like dating 16 women at once, so I'm going to take the list down to five. And, you know, I would use the tools I had available to me, online dating being one of them, to keep that list with the five best women available to me at any given moment. Now, some guys are saying, wow, this just sounds so mechanical. It may, but, you know, I'm talking about women who I really clicked with, not who I just enjoyed, but I said, hey, look, this woman has a potential for being someone very special to me long term. So I was in a position of evaluating the women instead of feeling like I had to impress the women I was meeting. When I felt like the list needed to change, I used online dating as my tool, for example, to go meet a few more women and maybe add a couple of them to the list. Contrast that with, hey, I'm going to spam mail a bunch of women online and and hopefully one will respond to me. Hmm. The kind of things I'm talking about here is what's involved with getting to the point beyond just the outer game to a point where, hey, I'm a confident man. I'm a truly masculine man. I figured out what that means. And I'm attracting the kind of women I want. Now I have a choice. I have lots of choices, not only among the women I'm spending my time with, but I have a choice of what to do with my life. In my case, I started dating lots of women. And on January 1st of this year, I decided I'm done with dating. I would rather spend the rest of my life with one incredibly excellent woman. And I am going to pick that woman this year. I narrowed my list from five to three. And I said, one of these women is going to be my future wife. I ended up meeting Emily, who at the time this interview goes to print is going to be my wife. And was she one of the three? 
she was not one of the three. You had to add another one. You had to start with number six. I actually, you know, I, I kept my options open, <laughs> which, here, you know, here's the moral of that story. If you're still keeping your options open, chances are the woman on the list that's going to be the one who makes it probably isn't on the list yet. Mm. I met Emily and the other three women were gone from my life within six days. Mm. Now, I did not act out of a sense of immaturity and I did not act out of a sense of urgency out of a sense of desperation or any of those negative terms. I spent a lot of time genuinely considering what it was I wanted out of a woman so that when I met her, I recognized her. And our relationship has been absolutely fantastic. We host a podcast together now called X and Y on the Fly. And she's fully involved with my life and mine with hers. And everywhere we go, people go, wow, you guys are just a super couple. Mm -hmm. We get comments from total strangers. You know, I want to speak to one of the things you said, which is um, date a bunch of women, find out what you actually like. Right. And uh, one of the things that I've learned in uh, in life, in business, in relationships, and it's such a it's such a tough one for the ego. It's like an ego hit. Is that things never turn out the way you really think that they will with hmm. other people? I mean, it's not never, but you know, it's a good uh, rule of thumb. That if you said to me, I want a six foot blonde who's, you know, a really intellectual uh, woman, you know, highly intelligent with, uh, you know, that has a great car. <laughs> I can almost guarantee you that if you, if I put that woman in front of you, it would blow your mind how different she is from what you thought she would be. Absolutely. Right. Because what you're talking from a perspective of never actually having been with that woman you're dreaming of before. Exactly. And so. When you get out there into the real world and you say, all right, you know what? I want a six foot woman that's really intellectual and you hop on, you know, one of these uh, online dating sites and you, you do a search and you find six foot blonde intellectual women and then you email all of them and you say, you know, one of my requirements is that you have a hot car. What do you drive? And, you know, they respond, you know, and it's, you're having fun. Um, and then you meet several of them. You'll realize that that's just not what you expected. Now, it might be a positive, not what you expected, but for the most part, there are going to be all kinds of things that you're going to find that you're going to just, it's going to blow your mind that these women are going to have about them. And that by going through this process of living it, of actually going out and dating a lot of women and interacting with them, and I'm not making any, you know, moral judgments. I don't care if dating to you means, you know, sleeping with them, not sleeping with them, hanging out with them as friends, whatever, just getting to know them in the real world. You will have so many ahas. You'll have so many realizations and you'll be able to ultimately do where I'm to land the plane here is to be able to recognize the woman that you really want when you see her based on actual experience and based on, you know, actual really interacting with women in the real world and knowing what it's all about rather than your imagination. The concept I've heard you use, David, is getting kills wanting. So in terms of your experience working with guys and, you know, now you've been writing and teaching and coaching and so forth, what do you consider to be the, um, you know, the factors, I guess, that uh, when you put them all together, create success? And what do you think the obstacles um, are the key obstacles that guys need to get over? Well, I believe that if you want to boil it down, there's four factors that if a guy can just get them together in his life, he will pretty much separate himself from just about every other man on the planet with his ability to attract women. The first one of those is masculinity. We live in a culture that's been feminized. Most of us have been brainwashed by a very thin minority of women who say to us, hey, all male behavior is bad behavior. All men are idiots. All men are jerks. We're going to send you to sensitivity training. We're going to send you to sexual harassment classes. And if you ever decide you're attracted to a woman and you make that known to her, we may just send you to jail for 10 years. Mm. And I think so many guys are paralyzed by that. And they are also, in many cases in this culture, raised by their moms. And, you know, famously, David, you've talked about how yeah. you know, your mom will teach you how to be nice and buy flowers and take her to dinner. And that whole horse has been beaten. What we get in a situation like that is not only do we get a mindset where we believe that male behavior is not necessarily something we want to demonstrate to women, which even saying it sounds twisted, doesn't it? 
Doesn't it make perfect sense that a woman would be attracted to a masculine man, yet we think masculinity is a bad thing and we wonder why we're not attracting women? Mm. We go from that mindset to really having, in many cases, not a lot of chance in our life to have a real man teach us what that means. Third, when does one become a man in the society? Is it when you grow pubic hair? Is it when you graduate from high school? Is it when you graduate from college? Some guys, unfortunately, which I don't advocate, come home to their mommies again after college because they can't afford a place of their own in certain parts of the country. When does a man become a man in the society? The concept of being masculine is widely misunderstood by most men. If men believe they need to be masculine, a lot of times that's acted out in terms of being what I call an IJ or an idiot jerk. And that ends up turning women off. I think the highest echelon of quality women will not fall for a man who's going to ruin their life. This bad boy who's just bad for them. And you and I, David, and you who are listening to this will probably not be willing to fall for a woman who's poisonous to your life. Unless she's very hot. (laughs) Yeah. And if I'm really nice to her, maybe she'll stick around. Yeah. Yeah. And only destroy my life 80%. (laughs) Yeah. Right. I guess still got the 20%, you know, shred of dignity. left. Yeah. Never underestimate the power of beauty. Right. Exactly. So if we're talking about a guy being masculine, how do we have the traits for a woman that a man should have without doing the jerky things? And this is an age old discussion, but do we ever think about it in terms of how is this attracting the kind of woman I want to attract, which is a high quality woman? Here's a couple freebies there. A lot of times the guys who, who are into say, Hey, don't kiss up to women want you to eliminate chivalry completely. Once you have your game to a certain level, you can be chivalrous to a woman without kissing up to her. When I pull a chair out for a woman, I pat the back of it and say, here's your seat. So I've led the woman to sit there instead of saying, oh, you're so beautiful. Let me serve you. Mm. And I find that women appreciate that. I open doors for 80-year-old women, not just really pretty women. So therefore, I become a good man who knows the importance of being masculine in this culture. When I get a woman in the car with me, I don't go, wow, you're so beautiful and I just want to serve you. What's your favorite restaurant? Can I take you there? I say, hey, look, I got this evening handled for you. And she goes, all right, well, here's a man who finally knows how to lead. I take her to a place. If we're going to a place, I know I'm on a slippery slope here with you, David, because I actually believe in taking women to dinner. But see, I have this fatal flaw. I like to eat. (laughs) So I actually, I couch it more in terms of, hey, look, I want to try this great restaurant. Are you going or not? Or am I taking someone else? Mm which somehow makes it okay for me. So I I put her in the car and say, hey, look, I got a surprise. I want to try this new restaurant and we're going. And it's amazing how many times I would take a woman to the restaurant and she'd go, wow, you read my mind. You're an amazing man. How did you figure out that I would love this? And I go, hey, you know, what can I say? (laughs) And women love that kind of leadership and love the chivalry and the whole concept that you espouse, David, of, of having a deep voice, leaning back, Having self-control, all those things roll into coming off as a masculine man. Have some masculine pastimes. Do things that guys do. In this culture, it's kind of cool sometimes if the women like football and if the women can fix their own, change their own clutch in their car, but it's almost never cool to women when guys do feminine things. And that will, that will help you become a man in the woman's eyes. Those are just a few examples. Yeah. But being masculine is huge. Yeah, let me talk to that a little bit. Um, there is a, you know, you know, I mean, I'm very interested in this topic. And um, there is a lot of confusion. There's a lot of, there are a lot of unknowns here. And for guys who, you know, they never, their masculinity circuits really never got turned on and developed. Right. So, you know, they haven't really developed this healthy sense of being a man. It can be a little awkward at first. And, you know, some want to just like stand up and puff their chest out and act like they think they're cool or tough or instead of, um, you know, pulling out the chair and, and, uh, you know, graciously saying, here's your seat. You know, they want to say you sit here and they don't get the nuance. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Uh, that, you know, I believe that one of the, the symbols of being a mature masculine man is to take on the role of the protector of those that need protection. Oh, you know, wow. let's talk about that in some depth. It, yeah. And I'm, I'm just going to point out a distinction and then I'd love to hear you run with it. And it's not that 
you're the protector of everybody because they can't protect themselves or because they're weak. It's because as a man, that's part of your role with your family, your loved ones, etc. And the distinction between I protect you because that's part of my role and that's who I am, as opposed to it's because you're this weakling that can't take care of yourself, that comes across in everything, in your communication, in your thinking. And there are those distinctions for everything. You know, seek out those distinctions, learn them, kind of develop them and become more comfortable. Because when you're interacting with women, they can tell whether you're coming from insecurity or weakness and you're faking it or because you've actually developed yourself into a person who believes the things that you're saying. You know, a very important distinction there as far as an inner game versus an outer game thing. If pulling out the chair is outer game, then you risk either looking like a controlling jerk by saying, hey, sit here or being a kiss up. I guess what I'm more thinking about is having an inner game mindset of, yes, I'm going to take care of this woman and make sure she feels comfortable with me. And pulling out the chair and saying, here's your chair and kind of just patting the back of it is a way of saying, hey, look, I'm taking care of you. Here's your chair. If you want to sit on the other side. You know, I'm not going to throw a hissy fit about it, but, you know, I'm taking care of you here. Mm. One of the worst, most dreaded things a guy who's shorter in stature ever hears a woman say, especially when it, it comes from a petite woman, is, you know, I just want a man who can protect me. Because the immediate flash in one's mind is, okay, she wants a gorilla who's going to be able to fight off all these thugs who are, and evil guys who are going to attack us when we're on the date tonight. Mm. You know, she wants to be protected. My realization has been that the woman wants to be protected most from the guy she's with. That's one of the big four. Another one of the big four. Nice segue there <laughs> is safety. Can I make a woman feel safe in my presence? And so if a guy who's shorter than average takes the mindset of, you know, I'm going to make sure this woman feels comfortable with me as a man. He has given that woman what she's truly looking for in terms of finding a guy who makes her feel protected. Now, obviously, even if you're a taller guy, that's still going to hold true. You may be a very large man and nobody's going to ever harm the woman you're with while you're with her. Unless, of course, he's got a bigger gun than you, which is another story altogether. Mm. But if, as a man, we are not making that woman feel secure in our presence, we're not going to get anywhere with her. We're certainly not going to get to a physical level with her. So, yes, having a woman feel safe is one of the big four factors that men who I think attract and keep quality women have. Let me also uh, just, you know, throw another quick little distinction out there, which is that I actually um, don't have any problem with, uh, you know, the idea of taking a woman to dinner. Um, I very strongly um, recommend that guys don't do it, especially when they're getting started, Right. Because typically what they do is they take, they, they use this as a, um, like an incentive for the woman. Right. We're trying to impress women by doing that, which doesn't work. Exactly. And if you don't really understand how to communicate to a woman that you're enjoyable to hang out with just to be around you, that she's going to actually, you know, get a lot of value just because she's in your presence. And then you're using, you know, let me buy you something or let me take you to dinner as the, the incentivization program, it just makes you so weak. And so, <laughs> but you know, I know a lot of guys that take women to dinner and I have taken women to dinner uh, many times, as long as it's done kind of the way you were talking about, which is it has nothing to do with, I'm trying to buy your attention, your approval, your affection. I'm, I'm going to go have dinner and I'm going to enjoy myself. And I'd love it if you uh, were there with me. Um, it doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't use that, that purchasing power mindset. <laughs> You know, as you're talking, I'm thinking, I'm running through the file cards in my brain, trying to figure out if the nature of the first date that we were going on has ever had any real impact on how much the woman was attracted to me. Mm. One of the most successful first dates I've ever been on was I was moving. It was time to, you know, fill up the new house with some furniture and I, I needed to go to the furniture store and I had no idea what to get. You know, my guy. And there was a woman I was interested in meeting, and it was going to be Saturday morning, and Friday night was booked. And I said, hey, what do you say you and I go furniture shopping tomorrow because I really could use your input? She goes, really? 
I go, absolutely. One of the greatest first dates I've ever been on. Mm. Had absolutely nothing to do with me spending a lot of money on her. In fact, if a guy is going to take her to a nice restaurant because he wants to go to the restaurant, the important thing to me is to be able to maintain a mindset of, look, here's who I am. Here's who you are. We're in a situation that's going to be natural lifestyle for both of us. If I'm putting myself into a situation that's somewhat artificial, we're dressed up more than we usually are, we're all on our best behavior, using our best manners, we're more likely to be giving the wrong impression to a woman than the true impression. That's my take on that. Mm. The third thing, and this is not in any specific order, by the way, is confidence. We talk about confidence all the time, but it's amazing. Just like you say, David, women can smell lack of confidence like a Doberman pincher can smell fear. Mm. And it is really difficult to go approach a woman you don't know. And it's something that we've got to do with confidence. And when we take a woman out to dinner, we've got to feel like we're going to confidently be able to get along with this woman. If this first date doesn't go well, I am confident there's other fish in the sea. All those little factors equal up to a larger factor called confidence. Here would be a great place to talk about the one simple event that I had happen to me one day, David, that changed my life in terms of approaching and meeting women forever. Mm. I'd been seeing a woman for a few months, and one time I'd met her best friend who was a 23-year-old woman who, I kid you not, was about six feet tall. Very skinny woman. So she's about five or six inches taller than I am and 15, 16 years my junior. And she's friends with the, with the woman I'm dating. So I met her once and it was a couple, you know, months or weeks previous to that and you know, kind of said hi and just we've gone over to her house to pick up something. And it was Saturday morning and, you know, like everybody else, I had to go to the Target and pick up a few things. So here I am with a shopping cart in Target and I see this woman. So I said, okay, well, you know, you always got to make nice with your girlfriend's friends, right? It's just the social thing to do. So I walked up to her and you know how you can kind of backhand someone real lightly on the shoulders to say, hey, I'm here. How you doing? Mm-hmm. I did that to her and I said, hey, how's it going? And she turned around and with it, gave me that eyebrow flash that the body language people talk about. Mm-hmm. Gave me a big smile and goes, oh, hey, how's it going? And I looked in her cart and I said, hey, so it looks like even superheroes like you and I have to have to still shop at the Target sometimes. And she kind of giggled and said, yeah, I suppose. So I'm talking to this woman. Another thing I left out is she's married. You know, she's, she's a married woman. This story is starting to get very interesting. <laughs> it is very interesting. So I'm talking to this woman, and she's starting to kind of invade my 18-inch space a little bit. She's starting to get close, and she's doing some of those signals that classically say, hey, I'm getting a little attracted. And me, I am simply talking to this woman because it's my duty as a boyfriend, basically. I really am not even attracted to her. I'm just being friendly. She's not my type at all. So based on the body language I was getting and the vibes I was getting, I was saying, okay, this is turning into a bad situation. I think I need to kind of move on and keep shopping. So I said, okay, well, it was nice talking to you. I'm going to continue shopping now. But I'll tell my girlfriend, and I used her name, I'll tell my girlfriend that uh, that you said hi. And she looked at me and kind of paused and said, who's she? And used the girlfriend's name. And I go, aren't you Jennifer? She goes, no, my name's Felicia. <laughs> <laughs> it was a mistaken identity. This woman was not even my girlfriend's girlfriend. And I laughed and I told her what happened. And I, I casually glanced down at her finger and she was unmarried. She didn't have a ring on, which I'd failed to, failed to notice, of course. And she, she said to me, well, I'll never forget what she said to me. She goes, that's it? <laughs> I said, yeah, well, I, you know, I'm sorry about that. You know, I'm just going to move on. Happy shopping. Right. Oh, nice. <laughs> and I realized here was a woman. Now, look at the details. The details are important. She's 15 years younger than me, at least. I'm, you know, she could have been in college. Okay. I'm 38 years old. I'm five inches shorter than she is. Okay. I'm shopping, pushing a cart, and I am not dressed to impress women. I mean, I've, I decided a few years ago I'm always going to have some style. I'm not going to just wear, you know, wife beaters and old shorts. So I looked decent, but I was definitely not dressed up and in the mindset of I'm going to meet women. And that was the secret to attracting her. I had absolutely no trepidation towards going to this strange woman, whacking her on the shoulder and say, hey, how are you doing? 
Certainly no pickup line. Therefore, I was perfectly confident. Perfectly confident because I didn't see it as a quote-unquote pickup situation. And look at the results. Mm. You know, I said, man, if I can bottle that up, <laughs> which I did. And yeah. it changed my life. And I hope it'll do so for everybody listening. If you're listening to that and you have any approach anxiety whatsoever, that same story I promise could happen to you. Now, I wouldn't recommend using it as a prop saying, hey, aren't you my girlfriend's friend? You know, I wouldn't recommend that. But the whole situation where I was not in a position where I was even interested in picking her up caught, created attraction with that woman. So look how important the confidence is and the natural approach is to a woman. And look how amazed they are when you're not afraid of them. Yeah, there's another uh, little piece to this, <clears throat> which is that a lot of times if you start a conversation with a woman that you don't know and that doesn't know you, sometimes there'll be like a few moments of discomfort. Like right. it's a little weird. It's a little not normal. And uh, I remember when the, I first used to see that and I kind of would read it like, oh, you know, she doesn't want you around. She's she's giving that body language of, you know, I don't want to talk to you. Wow. Yeah. And then I started realizing that there's kind of there's a distinction. There's a difference here between a woman giving you the I don't really want to talk to you right now and I'm uncomfortable with this whole thing. And uh, I'm just kind of a little shy and nervous that there's a guy talking to me and women will report that they um, are attracted to men who are strong and who can stay cool and calm and together through tough, stressful situations. And, and those are masculine traits. Exactly. And uh, when you approach women, sometimes you've got to understand that uh, you don't really know what mood she's in or where she's at. And you may need to just stay cool and calm and collected and comfortable with yourself and talk through several minutes of weirdness. Sometimes it'll be like the way you just said, where it's like instant chemistry. And sometimes it won't, but you have to either way, just go with it, just roll. That brings up a good point. I'm thinking right now about one of my, my most secret weapons about how to get a second aid. So many times when we get in front of a woman for the first time, especially if you've met her online and you don't even know her, you sit down with her wherever you're going to sit or you pick her up, you meet her, and you have no idea what to say first. And you just hit on something very important. Yeah, we're masculine and we have things handled with the woman and we're confident. But look at the importance of making that woman feel comfortable. If you're uncomfortable approaching her, she's automatically going to be uncomfortable with the fact you're approaching her. Right? Hmm. It's again, she's expecting the man to lead. I'm retired, of course, now. But when I went on first dates with women, I accidentally almost happened across, I guess I'll call it a technique that works really, really well when you meet a woman. Talk about something as if you've known her for a while. Talk about something strange that happened on the way. Keep your eyes peeled while you're driving to the date for something that's going to be interesting to talk about. And as soon as you sit down with her, wherever you are, open with it. Just say, hey, you know what? What do you think about this? I know you've used the tabloid example. Read you know, what's on the cover of People magazine this week and talk about it. Mm -hmm. But it really can be anything. And I think the magic phrase you hear from a woman when you know this is firing on all 12 cylinders. By the way, I like 12 cylinders better than eight. <laughs> when you know this is firing on all 12 cylinders, she'll go, wow, I've known you for 10 minutes and it feels like we've, we've known each other for 10 years. When you hear that from a woman, you know you're making her feel comfortable. Mm. And that's a, that's a huge piece of the puzzle. So most guys sit down and they're, what is it? The interview questions, right? Okay, so what do you do? How much money do you make? How long have you lived here? First of all, it's boring. Second of all, it's unnatural. Third of all, it's not creating a comfortable environment where you two feel like you're already friends. All right. How about now? I would love to hear more of your ideas on, um, you know, more about your program and your uh, your techniques and mindsets for guys who are shorter than average. This is just fascinating to me, and I just got to know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> well, by statistical analysis, at least half the guys listening to this are going to be at least average height or shorter than average. Hmm. There's plenty of guys who don't let this get in the way of their dating success. But it's amazing how many guys, and you know, I've done this before also, not necessarily with my height, mind you, but you know, for whatever reason being divorced or whatever, I said, hey, look, I'm going to make an excuse for not being able to go on dates. Women won't like me because of this. And I tree-hugged that excuse. 
I've found for a lot of guys who are shorter than average, they say to themselves, you know what, I've been told my whole life, hey, someday, you know, you'll get a growth spurt and you'll grow up big and strong. Growing up and being tall is what, you know, your grandmother always said you would be. And now that you grew up and you're not that tall, you read the online profiles and you read, I want a guy who's six foot tall or taller. Or you read, hey, the number one factor women look for when selecting a man is his height. And personally, I've never had my height be an issue in terms of dating women. As a matter of fact, I've had unsolicited comments from several of my girlfriends saying, you know, I never dated a guy under six foot before, but I really like you. So I went on the net and I said, hey, I can really relate to this because I am just, un I'm, I'm about five, six, maybe a little bit over. And I said, I've not had a problem with this. And I can look around me and some of the guys I know who are absolutely the most phenomenal with women I've ever met can be five foot or five foot one. It's all about who they are as a person. And I said, I wonder if anybody has ever addressed how and why they were successful as a guy who was shorter than average for the benefit of guys who may be very self-conscious about their height in mm -hmm. terms of approaching attracting women. It had never been done. And the more I Googled up articles and other people's writings, the more I found that there were actually articles out there. If you're a short guy, you know what? You're not going to get great women. <laughs> you're just going to have to settle for whatever you get because it's true. Every study says that women love tall guys. So sorry, you're just going to have to uh, settle for less than you think you deserve, right? And I said, that's pathetic because I know in my own life, I'm getting the women I want. And I'm not saying that to toot my own horn. I'm saying I've gone through this long process of deserving what I want, and it worked for me. And the fact that I'm five foot six had nothing to do with it. So I said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to roll up all the factors that I know help me as a guy who's not quite as tall in terms of attracting women. So I'm not going to just say, hey, look, you can get what the taller guys get. I'm going to try to figure out, I'm going to do a deep dive on why it is that women like me as who I am. And I also went to some of those guys I know, and I said, hey, look, what's your secret to attracting women? And I got some amazing answers from them. Learn just by watching sometimes. And I produced an audio program called Secrets to Success with Women for Shorter Men. And in that program, I found there's just a lot of material you can cover. We talked about the whole safety issue. A lot of guys just throw in the towel when they hear a woman say, you know, I want a man who can protect me. A guy who's self-conscious about his height will say, oh, she means she wants a big guy. Well, I'm out of the running. Another great example, women will put check marks by what they think they want when they're online. You know, they fill out a profile on Yahoo Personals or Match.com, and they say, yeah, okay, I'll take a guy who's 5'11 to 6'3". And it's amazing how when you actually write something compelling to women that shows you're masculine, confident, interesting, and can make them feel safe, They'll write back to you. And all those little check marks go out the window because they found a good man. Women absolutely put so many check marks down about what they want, and then they're more likely to deviate from those check marks than men are when they put those check marks. Because yep. men tend to say, okay, I like blondes, I'm going to go out with blondes. And we've already talked about challenging ourselves there. So there's this number of ways that guys give up on themselves before they've even tried. Now, I talk at length about the concept of a woman who's three to five inches shorter than you, regardless of what your height is. Now, I love petite women. I've been out with women 4'8", 4'10". My fiance is actually 5'1 and a half, so she fits this, this mold that I'm talking about perfectly. A woman who's three to five inches shorter than I am. Oh, and another aside, if a woman's 4'10 and you're 5'1", this would fit the description I'm talking about. So take that in consideration. Mm. If a woman is three to five inches shorter than the guy, they're statistically the same height. You follow what I'm saying? Yes. A woman who is 5'5 five five is average in the United States. By the way, a six foot tall guy is not average in the United States. I've had five foot ten people buy my program and I've, I've emailed them and said, hey, do you realize you're taller than average <laughs> and you're buying my short guy program? Yeah. Five foot nine is the average guy in the United States. And I know you have a lot of international listeners, so that can fluctuate one way or another. So looking at this objectively, if a man is five foot nine, he's average in the United States. And your mileage may vary in different cultures by a couple inches here and there. Yeah. The average woman in the United States is five foot five. 
Again, it varies a bit from country to country. So if you're a man who is five foot one and you're out with a woman who's four foot nine, or if you're, you know, my height, you're five foot six and you're out with a woman Emily's height, five one, five two, you're with a woman who is statistically the same as you in terms of height. Now, look for a second how women love men who are confident, men who can lead. Now, I will be the first to say that women who are petite in this culture generally don't hear you're short too much. There's enough guys out there who like tiny women that they don't really hear about it. Mm. Yet, there's still a huge cross-section of women who are shorter than average who are self-conscious about it. Agreed? Mm. Yes. I'm so short. I need to wear three inches heels because you know, I just wish I was taller. Yes. Yeah, no, I've heard that a lot. Now, in my case, I think Emily's perfect the way she is. She's 5'1". And incidentally, Emily did not have an issue with her height. But for a woman who does have an issue with her height, think of the impact of a guy coming along who's statistically the same as her, who's got that covered. He is comfortable in his own skin. He loves who he is, as he is, has no problem with his height. I mean, I'll even do self-deprecating stuff. I'll stand up in front of a crowd and say, hey, my name's Scott McKay, and yes, I am standing up. Everybody gets a laugh, and I'll keep going. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. If a guy comes along who doesn't feel like he's inferior because he's short, and he comes along and meets a woman who's statistically his height, who does have that issue in her life, he's leading, he's confident, and he makes her feel better about herself. He becomes her hero because here's a guy who I have something in common with, but wow, look how he handles himself. Look how he carries himself. Now, that is going to get her attention. Women who are five foot one, four foot ten, pick a petite size for a woman, five four for that matter. They say they want a guy six foot two, six foot three. What happens when a woman who is petite hugs a guy who's six foot two or six foot three? Oh. He basically has to bend down. What do you do? Pick her up and hug her? <laughs> no matter what, it is going to be an awkward situation. We can agree on that. Mm -hmm. One of the most important things I want to relate to a man who's shorter than average is if you can go up to a woman and get to the point where you can hug her, you know, you've, you've earned her trust enough where, where you get to hug her, give her a hug where you hold her, let her hold you, let her let go first. That's a great life lesson anyway. Whenever you're hugging someone, let them let go first. And don't be sexual. Don't be grinding your hips. Don't you know, say anything. <laughs> don't throw a little don't freak into the hug. Just silently hug this woman until she lets go. And when the hug is over, say, wow, it's like we fit. That is such a sexually charged thing to have that kind of physical sexual chemistry where a woman knows that when this man holds her, it's like two puzzle pieces. I call that the puzzle piece factor. And I can't believe the number of men who are shorter than average who have never hit on this and capitalized upon it in their life because they're squandering a golden opportunity to demonstrate to a woman, hey, here's something a guy who's shorter than average can give you that a taller guy just will never be able to do. Mm -hmm. And it's powerful. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. And any guy who's listening who's skeptical, try it. Give it a whirl because it will absolutely change your life. David, another important concept related to knowing what we want before we go out and deserve it is the whole concept of the age gap. Guys wanting to date younger women. I mean, some guys want to date older women too, which is fine. Mm -hmm. The importance is to know what you want. I have a very interesting conclusion I've, ri I've arrived at, and that's that most men, not all, most men who are my age, and I just turned 40, guys 35, 40, 45, maybe even older, think that the ultimate prize is to end up with a 23-year-old woman. If only I could date, you know, one of these young, tight hotties, I would have everything figured out. My realization is I think most of the guys focused on that are the same guys who can't get a 23-year-old woman. Because most of us who've actually had the pleasure of dating someone who is much younger than we were oftentimes end up feeling like we're babysitting. Now, if a guy finds a woman who is very mature, who is very young, and clicks with her and feels like he's got a lot in common, more power to that situation. I think I'm more speaking here to a guy who wants the eye candy. He's a guy who just wants someone to look pretty on his arm, and he thinks, man, if I could just get one of these 23-year-old hotties, I would have it made. I'd like to challenge that mindset. 
the way to avoid all the challenges of dating someone who's so young that you really can't relate to her in terms of a pop culture perspective, everybody talks about having the same music or whatever, life experiences, having the maturity level you're looking for in other ways, the way to get around that and still have a woman who's beautiful and sexy to you is to find a woman who's closer to your own age, who seems a lot younger. To me, this seems almost obvious, yet I've never heard it talked about anywhere. Mm -hmm. Everybody's like, okay, here's how you get a 23-year-old woman. Here's how you can be 50 and date a 20-year-old. What about a woman who's 35 years old and still gets carded? Mm -hmm. Who still has an incredible zest for life and a sense of adventure, yet she's got a great job, a good credit rating, <laughs> enjoys red wine, you know, knows how to talk to you about what you relate to. What about that woman? Now, that woman's rare. Mm -hmm. But if you're a man who deserves what you want and you know that how special such a woman is, you can learn to target that sort of woman. And I'll tell you, the results have been amazingly effective in my life. My fiance just turned 35. She regularly gets carded and is an incredible amount of fun. So this leads to kind of, I, I think it kind of dovetails nicely into the idea of, you know, separating a quote unquote quality woman from the rest of the women out there. Right. I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on what does it mean to separate, you know, or identify a quality woman? What is a quality woman and how do you go about it? Well, the first place that I think I start is I've dropped the whole concept of evaluating a woman based on her looks alone. There's so many women out there who think they can get by on being beautiful. And the sad part is a lot of them do. I'm going to have whatever personality. I'm going to be utterly selfish. Yet, because I'm beautiful, I can still attract guys. A quality woman to me is a beautiful woman who, for her own self, for her own sense of pride and self-worth, has taken the time to be the kind of woman who deserves what she wants the way I hopefully have in my life. This means that she has a sense of responsibility. She may be very intelligent and she has an outstanding moral, moral mindset, the kind of class where she handles herself. She has a sense of self-confidence. I can't believe the number of women in this culture who lack self-esteem. A quality woman knows she's a quality woman. And this is the kind of thing that when you're with her, you get her to talk about herself and the earmark of a woman, I think, who's lacking self-esteem is she says, I'm sorry all the time. One time a woman was saying, I'm sorry so much on a date. And I said to her, will you please stop saying I'm sorry? Guess what her response was? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> of course. And it seems so basic. It's like one of the bullet points you read when you're considering buying something that says, here's the one simple truth that will change your life. In this case, it really is a simple truth. Stop focusing on a woman's looks and start looking more at who she is and who you're potentially getting to know. Can you be friends with this woman? Is this a woman you'll trust? Is this a woman you want to spend the rest of your life with? And then you know you're on the trail of a quality woman. Just the simple concept alone of having self-esteem is just such a major factor I can't overemphasize. Mm. Here's another good acid test to know if, if you as a man are really going after the woman you want and looking for quality. As we all know, the media in this culture places a high priority on certain things of beauty. You have to be a skinny woman. You have to have a large chest, et cetera, et cetera. And to me, that's all designed to make people spend money chasing something that's very elusive. And when they don't get what the media is telling them they should be, well, then they go spend more money, right? A lot of times, we as men start choosing women. And the danger of this is especially clear after you start being able to select the women you want in your life, David. So mark that. Once a guy actually starts getting options, a very dangerous thought can start creeping into a man's mind that goes something like this. Now that I can choose the women I want, I need to go choose the woman everybody's going to think is the greatest looking woman. I need to go get a five foot ten Barbie doll so everybody can be impressed by who I'm with. You know, when I'm out with my friends, I want them to think I have the hottest chick there. I have a concept called perfect imperfection that I think is the absolute pinnacle level to a guy's mindset that signals to him he knows what he wants. He knows how to find a quality woman and he knows how to go get it. So he won't settle for anything. 
If I come to grips with the fact that I am not attracted to five foot ten Barbie dolls, which I'm not, but I'm in fact attracted to five foot one brunette women with spunky, wispy hair, cute voices instead of radio voices, and who laugh a lot, then I need to go find women I truly am attracted to, regardless of what other people think. Now, here's a great example. I talk to a lot of guys on the phone about where they are in their dating world and where they want to be. I can't believe how many men are actually attracted to women who weigh more than most women would think they should weigh. You follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. A guy, if a guy's dating a woman 5'6", he may think she looks better at 150 than she looks at 105 or 110, which would shock most women. Also, in terms of the size of a woman's breasts, women are out paying plastic surgeons untold amounts of money. Lots of guys I know, it really, that really isn't a huge factor in who, the, who they're choosing. They may not even have a preference for that. So once a guy becomes comfortable knowing what he wants in a woman, he can feel more comfortable going and finding that. And the concept of perfect imperfection is, hey, there are things about you that may not be media picture perfect. In Emily's case, she's got this little snaggle tooth on her bottom row of teeth. It's one tooth that's a little bit out of place. And, and on her, I just think it's who she is. I love it. I wouldn't change it for anything. It makes her more attractive to me. Therefore, her imperfections are made perfect by who she is, and she's perfect for me. Everywhere we go, everybody goes, wow, you two look like you were just made for each other. And that is completely by my design. And because I was a man who deserved what I want, it was in my control to make sure that happened in my life. Yeah, you're talking about something here, too, that uh, can be a, you know, can be an insidious problem. Once you start uh, having some success in life and you start being able to achieve it consistently, um, it's easy to let the uh, the insecure part of you start basing a lot of your decisions on what other people will think and approve of. Oh, you know, huge and, point. I can That can shape how much money you're spending on a car. Right now, I drive a pickup truck. I couldn't be happier. Big houses, people get big houses and they go, oh my gosh, I can't believe I have to walk all the way downstairs from this office to go get a beer. Yeah. <laughs> Everything isn't always what it seems. Yet, we feel like we've got to keep up with the Joneses, right? And yeah, not only with the kind of woman we have by our side in terms of meeting the needs of everybody else, but anything in our life. Our job, doing the rat race of, you know, I've got to climb the corporate ladder, it can really take its form in any, any way. Mm. Now, we're talking about feeling like we need to be seen with a woman in a certain respect. And earlier, I talked a little bit about when you go to a certain function, you know that you're with the greatest woman in the room. I think being with the woman that everybody knows is just perfectly suited and matched to you is part of that whole persona. In other words, you're not with the Barbie doll of the room. You're the guy who got the greatest woman overall in the room. You did better, as it were, than any other guy in the room. I think as guys, we all know that guy. We know that guy when we see him. Mm -hmm. And when Emily and I go somewhere, she, no, she's not a five foot ten Barbie doll. But there's going to be a guy in that room who goes, man, look at those two. And this woman I'm with, she's really pretty and everything. But ugh, that guy only knew what happens when I get home. Mm. That's what I'm talking about in terms of having the greatest woman in the world everywhere you go. And I think that's an important distinction when we're talking about, you know, the media perception of who we should be with versus this perfect and perfect concept. So I just wanted to make sure everybody, everybody got that one. Um, yeah, thanks for the clarity. Yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit more, I, you know, I know you have a lot of things to say about dates and kind of how to, uh, how to shape a date experience for a woman. And, uh, you know, just tell me some of your ideas here about that. Well, you know, we talked at length earlier about how, you know, we may or may not want to go spend a lot of money on a woman and take her on a date or whatever. I personally think that the nuclear weapon for any guy, whether he realizes it or not, is learning how to cook for a date. Now, so many guys go, hey, you know what? <sighs> cooking. I, I, I can't cook. I just go eat fast food and, you know, you know, cooking's for chicks anyway. Mm. Well, first of all, any guy who's ever watched the Food Network and seen Bobby Flay and Emerald and those guys know that, yeah, there's men out there who can cook and be a man about it. <laughs> <sighs> Women are enthralled by guys who can, who know how to cook. It's amazing. Like I said, it's a nuclear weapon. <laughs> 
I put on my profile, matter of fact, if you're listening to this and you know how to cook and you don't have on your online profile that you can cook for a woman, pause this interview right now. We'll wait and go put that in your online profile. Do it right now. It's that important. And we're back. And we're back. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I put in my profile, I'm an outstanding cook. If you think you are also, how about an Iron Chef battle in my kitchen? I had women emailing me saying, you're on. <laughs> I don't even know these women. And they're saying, yeah, not only will I have a first date with you. Yeah, I'll come over to your house. Mm. You know, the holy grail, as it were, is getting a woman to come over one's house, right? Mm. I can't believe the number of women. I got on the phone with them from an online dating. You know, we met online, an email or two, get them to the phone as quickly as possible. And I would say something to the effect before I figured out how powerful this was. Hey, you know, maybe we should get together sometime. Um, I've got this going on. You know, all the typical DYD stuff. Didn't want to, you know, say I was going to impress them. Mm -hmm. Here's what we're going to do. Well, you know what? It says here in your profile that you can cook. And, uh, you know, why don't you prove it? Why don't you cook for me? I don't, I'm not really all into getting gussied up and going out for a date. You, you say you're not a cook? Do it. And I would say... You mean like here at my house? Yeah. When can I come over? And I would have these women come over my house and I would cook for them. So not only do you have women feeling comfortable enough with you because they're making the invitation, they're doing the suggesting, hey, I want to come over to your house since you're going to cook for me. Once you get a woman in your house, and David, you've said this time again, you don't, you know, you don't have your paws all over them as soon as they get there. As soon as they get in the house, you're still cooking something. You give them a drink, say, hey, okay, let's chit-chat while we do this. The whole concept of eating together is a bonding experience. We see this in all different situations in life. If we have a business luncheon, it means you know we're building rapport as a team and we're going to do business together. If you eat with a woman, you are doing something together that creates a bonding experience. So guys, even if you don't know how to boil water, there are recipes that you just cannot, they're foolproof, they're idiot-proof. You cannot mess them up. And the secret is adding some nice fresh ingredients to them and doing the shopping and obviously asking your date what she's allergic to, et cetera, et cetera. That's all important. Add fresh ingredients, add something that's a little exotic as an ingredient, and you will impress the woman. No problem. And you haven't taken her to a fancy restaurant. You haven't spent a lot of money and you have her in your house. Now, not only do you have her in your house, but you, ha you hold the cards as to where this date is going to go, right? I've had women who wanted to come over my house for a first date, and I wasn't really into them. <laughs> I wasn't digging them. But I like to cook dinner, and I like feeding people like that. I've, I've come to a point in my life where I genuinely enjoy it. And I had a good time with this woman, and I said, all right, well, it's time for me to go to sleep, so I'm going to call it a night. She goes, that's it? I said, well, yeah. Yeah, thanks for coming. <laughs> but see, I, I, had, I had that situation in hand. So, yeah, if you're meeting a woman online, she comes over to your house, you're going to risk that she's not the woman you're looking for. But at least you're getting women coming over your house. You know, you've got that handled. That's not something that has to be any more complicated a process than that. Mm -hmm. But when you do have a woman who comes over and you're attracted to her, as long as you can do all those principles that you talk about, Dave, where, you know, you're not needy, you're not clingy, you're not needing this woman, then you can cook for her, which will knock her socks off. You can eat together, which will be terrific. And then you have an outstanding built-in opportunity for what I think is just one of the greatest things a guy can have in his toolbox, which is what I call the most important 30 minutes in dating. Ready for this? I'm, I was born ready for the most important 30 <laughs> minutes in dating. As soon as you're done eating, you have two choices. You can either have dessert or you can not have dessert. A lot of times... Everybody's too full for dessert. What's the woman expecting to happen after dinner's over? She's expecting the guy to start putting the moves on her, mm -hmm. right? She's got her antenna up saying, hey, you know, I'm attracted to this guy and he's attracted to me, but oh gosh, here it comes, right? Do you know what you do at the end of cooking for your date and eating together? You do the dishes. <laughs> You're killing Any, me. If a guy listening to this does not get a first kiss, if he so wants a first kiss, after perfectly executing upon what I'm going to say, then I really have nothing else that can help him. He's truly a basket case. <laughs> Doing the dishes is the magic, huh? Here's how it works. When you're going through the courses, you don't want to stop right there and do the dishes in between. So, yeah, you've cleaned up a little bit ahead of time. You've got 
a sink that's empty to begin with. As you're done eating, you take the plates and you put them in the sink. When you're done eating, you don't have, you know, you finished dessert or you didn't want dessert, whatever. You go, okay, let's go do the dishes. And she'll go, what? I said, yeah, it's time for you to, you know, do your part here. Let's go and do the dishes. And she'll go, okay, whatever. So you pick out, you know, I don't care if you have a dishwasher or not. Someone's got to rinse and somebody's got to, you know, yeah. put them in the machine or dry them. Here you are standing next to a woman you're attracted to and who may be attracted to you, standing side by side in the kitchen, okay? You are not making the moves on her, and she's expecting you to, which means you are increasing the comfort level she's feeling with you because she can't believe your paws aren't all over. And you know as well as I do, that's increasing attraction. Mm. Then the flirting starts. I'll tell you straight up. If she takes a wooden spoon and whacks you on the tail with it, (laughs) right then and there, you turn around by both shoulders, throw her against the refrigerator, and kiss her brains out. (laughs) You're done. Go, Go for it. If it doesn't happen perfectly like the book like that, You know, you're washing dishes. I don't care what she says. All you say after a little while of doing dishes, you say, look, you know, if if you don't stop acting like a brat, I'm going to have to splash you. (laughs) Hopefully she'll splash you first, at which point you better kiss her. If not, you splash her, turn around like nothing happened and wait for her to splash you back. Then you kiss her. <laughs> so in other words, you There'll wait for the... There'll be so much sexual tension there doing the dishes by virtue of you standing there, not doing nothing but standing next to each other. I guarantee it will work and it does everything. You're waiting for either the spoon to hit you or some dish water, and that's your signal to kiss her. That is your signal. That's beautiful. I think this is literally as foolproof as your, um, your kiss test, David. <laughs> that's fantastic. So cooking for your date, look at this whole picture. You have done something for a woman that shows you're interested in her without being needy or clingy. You have fed her. You've eaten with her. She knows that you're not all about yourself, that you're willing to give a little. You've shown some hospitality. This whole time, look, guys, keep in mind, you're Bobby Flay. You're not Julia Child. Mm. If you have to use the grill to make the shrimp to put on whatever you're making, do it. Make a masculine dish. You're not going to make quiche or some cute little fluffy thing. Make your favorite thing. Make make steak. Give the woman a masculine dish. Move quickly in the kitchen. If you're deciding you're going to go all out for this and you're going to get all the toys like you would if you picked up a hobby, go for the stainless steel utensils. Be a man about it. <laughs> Feed sounds the woman. like a commercial. Yeah, right. Feed the woman. Take care of her. Be a man about it. Don't be sexually needy. And at the end, you do the dishes. And it's amazing what happens from there. Mm. Another great thing is, you know, you can say, hey, look, man, we ate too much. Let's go take a walk. So cooking for your date is just absolutely rife with potential. All right, Scott, uh, thanks for sharing some some very interesting and many original things I've never heard before. I really appreciate them. If uh, someone wanted to, uh, you know, get their hands on some of your programs, uh, how would they find your materials online? Okay, David, perfect. In addition to the program for shorter men, we also actually have a book about cooking for your date, which not only includes some of the strategies, just a brief bit we've talked about here, but actually some of the recipes that really are foolproof. Nice. We have that. We also have my first book, which is Deserve What You Want, appropriately titled. And all of those can be found at what I'm announcing to be a special URL just for listeners of this particular program. Because I cajoled you into it. <laughs> there you go. Not a problem. We're at www.deservewhatyouwant.com front slash DYD. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for taking the time with me uh, today, Scott. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. The Mountaintop Podcast is produced by X and Y Communications. All rights reserved worldwide. Be sure to visit www.mountaintoppodcast.com for show notes. And while you're there, sign up for the free X and Y Communications newsletter for men. This is Ed Roy Odom speaking for the Mountaintop Podcast. <laughs>